BioNTech founders Ergur Sachin and Uslem Tureci developed the world's first effective COVID-19 vaccine. Now they've received Spain's highest honor, the Princess of Asturias Award, for their services to science and technology. Euronews caught up with the couple to discuss their success, creating scientific supergroups, and what they're planning on doing next to change the world. OK, well, first of all, I'd just like to say uh, congratulations on uh, winning this award. Uh, how do you feel about it? It's, it's uh, very humbling and we feel honoured and, and overjoyed, uh, Tokes, because uh, it's a very pre prestigious award and more importantly, it celebrates everything which contributes to serve to humanity. What do you say to people who are still hesitant about taking the jab? Uh, I think we have to, on the one side, to listen yeah, uh, about the concerns because there is a lot of wrong information spreading and people are concerned because they don't know whom to trust. Yeah? And it's therefore our, our task uh, to inform, yeah? and it's the task of the society, of everyone in the society, to keep communication. I think it's really important that everyone who received the vaccine and tolerated that communicates, communicates that. We have to come together as a society and avoid that we, that we end up in, in different bubbles uh, uh, with different realities. What we were initially hearing you know, more than a year ago was that it was impossible to create a vaccine in such record time and yet you've done it. So can you understand their fears and reluctancy? Yes, absolutely we can understand that and uh, this is not specific for this vaccine. This is uh, a general and, and uh, uh, a very natural reaction that people want to first understand what is going on and uh, because there is so much information it's more difficult to sort through, through it. Uh, we are uh, doctors by training. We uh, have treated cancer patients, for example. And in each and every case where we treated, we have gotten the same questions. What does this treatment mean for me? Does it harm? People want to be informed about what will happen with them and their body. So this is very natural. And what is also important to understand is, is that the vaccine was not developed in one year. So the vaccine was developed with three decades of research. It is like a, like a sprinter who trained his life for, the, for, this, for this event yeah, and is fully trained and prepared uh, to, to go in the shortest possible time and win the race against this pandemic. And that's also important to understand that the sci science behind the vaccine took us 30 years. But let's talk a bit more now in, de in depth about the, the messenger RNA which you've been working on. Where else do you see it leading? Oh, um, mRNA has a transformational potential. Um, mRNA is uh, the most ancient information technology, so to say, invented by nature. So you can transport information into cells, you can tell different cells of the body what to do, uh, which means, in principle, you can use it universe, universally. It's a toolbox from which you can assemble what you need for a certain disease or for a certain mechanism. The only limiting thing is to understand the disease and understand what type of information we want to convey. Once you know this, you can use mRNA against cancer, against autoimmune diseases, against allergy, for regeneration, and we are working on all of those indications and beyond. So what are you setting your sights on next? Then? A cure for malaria, perhaps, or a, perhaps a cure for cancers? We, are, we, are, we have now, now um, the opportunity to work on, on different diseases. On the one side, uh, we would like to use um, um, our mRNA technology uh, for fighting diseases which, are, which have, uh, have been um, a challenge for humanity for more than uh, 100 years, like tuberculosis, like malaria, but also diseases like HIV, for which there is no cure existing. So that's one box, and we, we, have, we have already started uh, programs to develop vaccines against that. And on the other side, we are continuing our work on cancer uh, uh, to develop uh, cancer vaccines which uh, to train the immune system of the patient to fight their cancer. 
now that you're you know, presumably more than paper billionaires, how's that changed your lifestyles? Not at all. Uh, it has not changed our, our lifestyles. Our lifestyles are defined by what, what we need to, to feel that we are contributing to something uh, bigger. Uh, and um, it's not defined by what we, we seem to have uh, uh, um, uh, monetarily. So our lifestyle is the same. But easier to get up and go to work in the morning now? For our research and for the development of no novel medicines, which uh, are on our list, this is a turbocharger. Obviously, it helps us to invest all uh, uh, in all those areas in which we think we need to accelerate, we need to go broader, we need to go deeper. So uh, it has been a blessing that uh, helping uh, to respond to the pandemic allows now uh, to reverse engineer uh, those pre proceeds into other areas where there is similar need. What other areas are you personally looking at now? So we are, we, we are looking broadly. So we, we have even more than 500 patents uh, on different technologies. And, and we believe that the future uh, um, will have two challenges. On the one side, disease will become more individual. Yes, many of these diseases like cancer, autoimmunity, allergy, uh, but also aging are individual diseases with individual components. And we believe that it is not any more appropriate to have, have the same drug uh, because it's the same disease. Everyone has a different disease. And we want to, to establish individualized treatments. And we have generated ideas, developed technologies to deal with that. And uh, it's about cancer, and as Ozem, as Ozem said, about autoimmunity. It's about inflammatory diseases. And it's also about, about diseases like myocardial infarction. Yeah? Because what is important to understand is that our immune system is involved in all of these diseases. And we are immunologists, and we understand how to, to mediate, mediate immune responses and change the behavior of the immune system. Well, you're here rather to pick up uh, this uh, prestigious award for science and technology and the award that you're sharing with other people in your field. Is there any chance of you creating, if you like, a scientific supergroup to do more? We are already a scientific supergroup, the, the scientific community. And this was the amazing thing also in the pandemic, where everyone has instantaneously uh, published and made available their observations, their findings, uh, characterizing the virus, characterizing new variants, the sequence of the virus. So we are already a big community, which now even is more tightly not with the experience of the pandemic. And we really trust that this will even improve more because this is really this working together, sharing data uh, is what, we what will help us also in the future in situations where a crisis can be conquered with science. Okay. We well, both have a reputation as being workaholics and some might say that's really good for society in general right now. Um, you know, do you have any sort of dreams of professional dreams of doing things outside the scientific realm? Is there a place outside the scientific <laughs> realm? I don't understand oh, yeah, the I question. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking, well, you've got the, you know, the, the, the money now, the influence, uh, the power, you clearly have the knowledge, and would you think of applying that to anything else, for example? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we are driven by two, two motivations. On the one side, curiosity, and we love science, and on the other side, we would like to be useful, yeah? And I believe you can also be useful without doing science, and we, we got interested more and more to understand uh, what are the biggest challenges of humanity, and what are the factors outside of the science which need, need to, be, to, be, to be addressed to enable that, that these people uh, could, uh, could benefit. And, and so we are, we are now in, in conversations with, with, with uh, other people who have the same ideas and understand how they, what they do and whether we could help. And this is also, also uh, a motivating aspect. 
And I was also curious as to, you know, how the, it worked between yourselves. You've got this tremendous union working on a personal as well as a professional basis, but, you know, what areas do you disagree on? Um, every time when we disagree on certain topics, and we disagree every day on many topics, is a chance to come up with something which is even better, better what we think. So we, we love the scientific debate. If we dis disagree on something, it's most often about, about, about what we believe, what the science tells, tells us. And after this discussion, it is, it is a great satisfaction to understand Ersdam's position yeah? and to come up with, with an understanding which is better than the understanding that I had before. And, and therefore, I see it always as a chance to, to, have a, to not agree on things and have this discussion. Uh, would you share that viewpoint as well? Yes, yes, I, I share, share it. Uh, we can work efficiently together even though we are married. <laughs> But that certainly sounds like a recipe for success, not only for a professional life, but also for marriage as well. Well, I, I thank you both for taking time to speak to me on this global conversation. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. This, this was a pleasure on our side. Right, thank you.